Wake up. It's the Sleep Unplugged podcast, episode 108, the menstrual cycle and sleep. God's little gift is on the rag. Welcome everyone to the Sleep Unplugged podcast. My name is Chris Winner. I'm a neurologist, sleep specialist, and your host. For a very special episode of the podcast, if you are a frequent listener of the podcast, welcome back. If you're new to the podcast, welcome to the family. I say this is a special episode because we've had two episodes, I believe, written about written by our producer, Maeve Winter. The first was Sleep in Menopause, which was episode three. And we did another one, Sleep and, oh gosh, what was it? I'm blanking. Um, I don't remember what it was. I think it was something about sleep and maternal health. Uh, I can't believe I'm blanking on, but she wrote that one. And this is now the third episode that she has contributed to in terms of saying, hey, look, I really want you to do an episode for me uh, for a couple of reasons. One, it's important to me. It was perinatal sleep, episode 68, our producer wrote, and now episode 108, Maeve is back. And we'll get to the reasoning behind this episode in just a little bit. So if you're interested in the podcast, talking about topics you'd like to uh, hear about or things that are on your mind, comments, corrections, criticisms, you can reach the podcast, DR Chris Winter Instagram, DR Chris Winter Twitter. Please like and follow me on both platforms because I'm going to be putting some important information on there at the end of this podcast um, that's related to this episode that I want you to see. If you like the music that we always talk about at the beginning of the podcast, you can find it on our Spotify playlist. We are now on episode, we are on uh, volume three, and we'll get to our artist, Cheryl Crow, in just a moment. So comments, corrections, criticisms, got a great one related back to an episode we did not too long ago. Episode 106 was on hypnosis and sleep. And I got a wonderful communication from Sandra Anderson. She's a certified hypnotherapist in Auburn, California. And she wrote, your podcast, you know, hey, Chris, a big fan of your podcast and your book. Your podcast was a bit encouraging, but it could have been so much more if I'm being honest. So I agree. And if you're a listener, if you're a veteran of this podcast, my guess is you're thinking many of Chris's episodes could have been so much more. And, you know, that's a that's a whole other topic that I always think about in terms of, you know, medical television shows that, you know, we've got certain expertises, but we've got to fill a medical television show or I've got to come up with a podcast episode every week. And to say that I'm an expert on hypnosis or the menstrual cycle would be not true at all, but I'm certainly interested in learning about all of these things. And that's sort of the selfish reason for the podcast, isn't it? Is that I get to take time out every week to sort of learn about or dive deeper into something related to sleep and, and better myself and maybe hopefully better take care of the people that I see. So I agree with you, Sandra, that hip, that hypno uh, hypnosis episode could have been much more, but, and she goes on to say, I describe hypnosis as a meditation with a purpose. I teach all my clients how to count themselves down to relax their body and most importantly, relax their mind. These tools create new neural pathways so my clients can intentionally halt an old habit and choose the thought feeling that is going to allow them to move more easily toward their goal. Sometimes a client has an old belief or subconscious program that is keeping them stuck in an old, unhelpful pattern or habit. Gee, what does that sound like? Hint, insomnia. Hypnosis is working with the creative subconscious part of one's mind, which is 95% of how we interact with and experience the world. I've found it to be very powerful, a very powerful modality, and I help my clients achieve goals, release old beliefs that are no longer serving them, and frankly, just feel better overall, which helps them sleep too. Well, I think that sounds awesome. I think it's a great way to describe it. In fact, when I did the episode on hypnosis, Maeve, who is also a certified yoga instructor, said, yeah, you know, hypnosis is really close to a lot of the things that we teach in yoga. 
a sort of form of relaxation, a form of meditation. And that's really the first thing that, that Sandra said. So Sandra, I really appreciate you listening. I'm glad we could at least shine a light or bring up a conversation topic like hypnosis and sleep, even if we could have done better. And um, we will continue to try to do the best we can. Um, for the title of this episode, I, I really thought hard about it. Um, there were a couple other songs in the running, but I went with A Change Will Do You Good by Sheryl Crow. I thought it was important, number one, to have a female artist um, highlighted. And, you know, part of this episode and part of the research that Maeve, our producer, does has to do with menstruation and the way we characterize it, think about it, kind of vilify it. It's something that we don't talk about. It's, uh, you know, taboo. I'm 51 years old, you know, growing up, that was just sort of off the table in terms of talking about it. And we also sort of sometimes kind of make it into a bad thing or something you would make fun of somebody for. Even the way we, the, the phrases we use to talk about it are to some degree derogatory. So I thought it was interesting that, oh, I like this line from Sheryl Crow, God's little gift is on the rag because it not only encapsulates the on the rag uh, description for menstruation, which again is not particularly positive in my eyes, but God's little gift. And there's so many religious references to menstruation. I remember reading the book, The Year of Living, Bibli Living Biblically, I believe was the title, where a reporter, like Abrams, I think was his name. I, I can't quote me on that. I can't remember his name. But this guy basically read the Old Testament and tr I believe, I think it was just the Old Testament, it may have been the entire Bible. And he tried to live exactly based upon the teachings and the laws laid out in particularly the Old Testament. I mean, like building a tent in his New York City apartment, couldn't touch his wife during certain stages of her menstrual cycle. I mean, it was out there. He wore like clothing made of certain animal skins. He let his beard grow. I mean, anything the Bible said you had to do, he did it. There may have been some exceptions, but it was really interesting, you know, as, as somebody who's not really studied the Bible, you know, all these teachings were in there. But I think menstruation was something that I remember thinking, wow, you know, he was, he was, the Bible taught certain things around menstruation and the way we, you know, look at it. And they weren't particularly positive. So I thought that was pretty interesting. So this was, uh, Change Will Do You Good was a song off of Sheryl Crow's second album. It was her self-titled album, Sheryl Crow, came out in 1996 after Tuesday Night Music Club. It was a real departure. Sheryl Crow's debut album, Tuesday Night Music Club, Tuesday Night Music Club re referenced a group of musicians and songwriters that she kind of played around with. Cheryl Crow was a backing vocalist for Michael Jackson on his bad tour and had kind of a, you know, a tepid musical career. And then she released this album and it was enormous, like eight singles off of it. And she famously played leaving Las Vegas on Letterman and Letterman said, oh, is this song about you? And she said, yes which wasn't true at all. It was actually written by another member of the Tuesday Music Club, I don't remember his name, about the book of the same name, Leaving Las Vegas, the Nicolas Cage, Elizabeth Shue, was made into a movie. It had nothing to do with Elizabeth, uh, with, with uh, Sheryl Crow. So that created a lot of tension with this music group, so she split from them. And then Sheryl Crow was music and, and lyrics that she basically wrote herself with maybe a few other people, but that sort of Tuesday Night Music Club was sort of separated. And the song that I really liked off of her self-titled album was If It Makes You Happy. I thought that was just a banger of a song and re really great guitars on it. And so really like her a lot. I uh, can't really think of a great link between Sheryl Crow and David Bowie, although Sheryl Crow released a song a bit later. I kind of lost track of her career at some point. But in 2008, she she had a song called Love Is All There. And I remember hearing it and thinking, oh, I think this is, David Bowie's song, Valentine's Day, and then realized, no, this is Sheryl Crow. And Sheryl Crow wrote her song in 2008, David Bowie in 2013. I think David Bowie famously pinched things 
from other artists. And I've always wondered if maybe he lifted that from Sheryl Crow. So we'll put Sheryl Crow um, on our Spotify playlist. So let's get into the overview of our podcast. So the idea that the menstrual cycle is featuring sort of changing hormonal levels and that fluctuation in estrogen and progesterone can affect your sleep, I think is pretty settled science. We, we, we know that. And we see that reflected in individuals as they transition from pre-menstrual cycle into you know, their first menses and exhibiting a menstrual cycle to perimenopausal women. These are, you know, women across the spectrum that we deal with in clinics all over the place. And, and this is really starting to get more and more attention. And one of the things that interests me most about this topic is I've talked to Maeve about it, is that she really wanted to make sure that we emphasize the importance of the reciprocity that yes, estrogen, progesterone, and their relative relationship to one another can have clear impacts on sleep quality. But sleep quality, the way we sleep, the consistency of our sleep can also work backwards and affect menses in the menstrual cycle. And I think that's a really important way to look at the whole picture. And it's helpful to create consistent established rhythms when it comes to our sleep because that quality sleep can really be helpful in terms of regulating the menstrual cycle particularly in individuals who have difficulties maybe doing that and you know this relates to so many things we've talked about doesn't it that chrononutrition uh if you're having difficulty sleeping yes you know, no caffeine before you go to bed and no alcohol. Very important. We don't want to underestimate that. But the consistency of your exercise that week could impact your sleep. The consistency of when you ate food, when you saw light and avoided it, when you were on your phone and off your phone, all those little decisions we make related to time have definitive impact, not only on our sleep, but our general health. And I think you could take out the phrase general health and pop in menstrual cycle and you would be equally as correct. So let me give you a little background on this episode. This was, this was not, I've got a huge list of topics that you all have given me. This was not on that list. And my daughter Maeve, who produces the show, as you know, came to me and said, I'm working through my own personal journey here and having this very interesting intersection between my personal journey and sort of my professional and academic journey. And so Ames began, or Ames, um, Maeve began working as a, at, at a yoga studio in New York and then began training as a yoga instructor. This is the integral uh, Integral Yoga Institute in Soho. It's amazing. I've talked about it in episodes before. They do such a great job. And every time I go to New York, I always try to pop in and take a class. And now we'll be able to take a class from one of their newest instructors, Maeve. And she says, while she's consistently practicing Hatha yoga, she noticed that her previously irregular menstruation became synchronized most precisely with the arrival of the full moon. And just a little bit of background about Maeve, extremely objective, extremely kind of uh, academic science. So to say, you know, suddenly my menstrual cycle seems to be aligned with the moon. I, you know, I believe her, you, you as the listener don't have that personal relationship with her, but I'm like, wow, I, I believe you. This sounds really interesting. I don't think this is something that you, I, I, knowing you, you would want to pick apart that theory. Uh, so I find that really interesting. So this really sparks sort of a deep interest in not only the menstrual cycle, but how her life, her stress, her yoga, her consistency, inconsistency, her lifestyle choices were affecting her na the natural cycles of her body and how that all links to a greater picture of health and wellness. So more background, Maeve is currently studying psychology. She's in a, a graduate program at Columbia University, Teachers College. Uh, we've mentioned Venus Mamudi. She works in the uh, 
uh, the the clinic that that or the 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 lab that Venus runs, which looks at the Muslim maternal health in particular, which is really fascinating and completely you know, under underserved and probably underlooked at and and they're working hard to correct that. And so in working in these different environments, the academic, the the yoga studio, Maeve came up with this thesis project. And she is collecting anonymous survey responses from people aged 18 to 50 who experience a menstrual cycle and are affiliated with a religion or spirituality. So if that describes you, you have a menstrual cycle, and you describe yourself as being sort of religious or spiritual, there is, we'll post some information on my social media about being able to participate in her study. And she's, her recruitment's doing great so far, but she has really high hopes for recruiting several hundred women into the study. I believe there is no risk to it. All the information will be in the information that we provide. So if that's something of interest to you and you would like to help out a young graduate student who's very interested in this topic, that would be fantastic. So these are very understudied. And we've talked about that before. You know, what is the information about the menstrual cycle? What is the information about spirituality and menstruation? There's probably not a big body of evidence or body of work out there. So doesn't mean it's not important. Doesn't mean there aren't important discoveries and relationships to be made just means that up until this point, not really heavily looked at. So she's interested in looking at these understudied groups, which is strange because of the high prevalence of sort of spiritual and religious conceptions around menstruation. So we talk, it's talked about for since antiquity, since the time of the Bible, yet the way we think about menstruation is not really something that's studied. And so she really feels like there's something very empowering and positive about menstruation, yet, as we talked about before, culturally, in religious, in some religious teachings, this is sort of shown to be negative. And you know, thinking about it myself, it was always something that we hid, right? You know, suddenly Tammy is missing from your sixth grade class. Well, she was here earlier and we're doing a project together, you know, and in social studies, well, she had to go home. It's all very mysterious while Tammy suddenly gone from the classroom. She's back the next day. And let me tell you something, Tammy doesn't want to talk about what happened yesterday, why she disappeared from school and her mother had to come pick her up. So it's always kind of like that, you know, which is interesting. I mean, if you had a nosebleed, you wouldn't, you know, where'd Chris go? He was playing dodgeball, got hit in the face, where do you, oh, well, his dad had to come pick him up. We're not talking about that. We're not talking about some blood coming out of his nose. Why? Like, you know, so, but if it's, you know, with Tammy's situation, we don't talk about it. And, you know, I think that it's really interesting as, as I've talked to Maeve about this, you know, over dinner and when we get together, I find it fascinating. I know nothing about it, but I do find it fascinating that something like this is often made to be negative and, and, and how do people feel about it in, in today's world and how does re religion and spirituality influence that? So there'll be a link on the Instagram page. If you fit the criteria, please take it. If you have the ability to share that, that would be so awesome. It would really help. Um, she, uh, she wrote, I really need help with recruitment. <laughs> so we're going to do that. So let's think about the connection between the lunar cycle and the menstrual cycle. You know, this was something else as we were talking about it, we were just kind of sitting around, she's down uh, visiting me right now. And we were thinking about songs. She's like, oh, what about like that song about the moon by, um, uh, I think it's Camper Van Beethoven. I was like, oh, you mean the killing moon? She's like, oh, okay, yeah, that's not great. I was thinking it was like the red moon. And then I remembered um, Mexican moon by Concrete Blonde, which is a killer song. And I was like, oh, let me, let me scan through the lyrics of that song real quick. Maybe she re re references a red moon. And so I thought that would be really cool. So, you know, there's a, there's this connection we sometimes think about with menstruation and the lunar cycle. In fact, you know, Maeve mentioned this and I kind of was like, well, that's interesting, you know, but it seems kind of random. It's not random at all. Ancient Greeks, ancient Romans, Mayans, Egyptians, all associated the moon with menstruation, 
fertility life cycles in your and and as we were talking about that, I said, like, oh yeah yeah you're right absolutely in fact when you think about you know moon goddesses and things like that there was often that fertility element to it as well and aim mave is super interested in mythology it has been since she was little you know, now her mother works at a big museum in sarasota florida where all this european fine art everything has religious and mythology undertones to it we were just talking about a painting the the Elysian garden painting i can't remember who did it but it just just pack full of mythology interacting with you know the people in the in the painting it's fantastic so in the 1960s and 70s there was research being conducted on the light of the moon and the influence over individual body fluids that's a quotation which demonstrated the moon's connection with hormonal menstrual changes and this is a quotation that may found from that paper the macrocosmic cycles of nature such as the ebb and flow of the tides and the change of the seasons are reflected on a smaller scale in the menstrual cycle of the individual female body so we kind of looked around for more current studies that kind of reproduce that and i really wasn't able to find it but i do think it's interesting that there is this sort of older body of research it really connected these two things and you know is attempting to sort of maybe understand what you know the underpinnings of these mayan and roman beliefs may have been so there has been a big hormone women's health paradigm shift we've talked about this uh, several times on the podcast this widespread misconception that estrogen is the women's health hormone i think is sort of being dropped and instead we're coming into a more complete picture of hormone balance as it comes as it pertains to women and their health and looking at not only the balance and relative ratios between estrogen and progesterone but also the the direction the rising and fall so when you think about all the different variables it's not just how much estrogen it's how much estrogen in relationship to progesterone and is the estrogen level going up is it going down is it going up quickly is it falling slowly all these things really matter in terms of the menstrual cycle but also in terms of how this interplays with sleep and it kind of reminds me uh and this is just kind of the way i think about things hdl cholesterol ldl triglycerides We've really gone from thinking about a cholesterol number to thinking about these lipids in terms of relative ratios to one another, that being a much more important indicator than this, the number. And I think you could probably say that when it comes to the, you know, the amount of estrogen, but also looking at it in terms of the amount of estrogen in relationship to progesterone and the directions those things are moving at any particular time. So when we think about women's reproduction, uh, reproductive and overall health, it becomes op optimized when the menstrual cycle, estrogen, progesterone are balanced within this very complex ovarian system. And this is a term that I just sort of became aware of that's sort of being pushed out there to sort of underscore the importance of looking at these hormones dynamically rather than sort of in isolation and, and in a frozen moment of time. And so there's this constant back and forth in women's cycles between these two hormones, the estrogen, which is sort of promoting growth and proliferation versus the progesterone, which is inhibiting proliferation and enhancing differentiation and promoting maturation. So the balance between these two hormones is really thought to be the key to reproductive health. But both hormones work together to regulate sleep and the imbalances and the fluctuations can lead to various sleep issues. And we're just really starting to learn about those things right now. And research seems to show that you know, it's less about who's in charge, um, estrogen or progesterone, and more about the overall rising and falling and dysregulation. Because we've thought for a long time that post-menopause, lower estrogen, you're more at risk for sleep apnea, you're more at risk for hot flashes, which is disturbed sleep, and you're more at risk for disturbed sleep in general. But I think newer research might really be looking at this in a bit more of a dynamic way. So let's look through the menstrual cycle and look at how the different phases seem to affect sleep. But I think that this is probably a good time 
to note that every individual is different and everybody's going to have a slightly different, you know, take on this. So, you know, in general, when people exercise right before they go to bed, it's not great. In general, when you eat a lot of food right before you go to bed, it's not great. I guarantee you there's somebody out there who says, look, I exercise right before I go to bed and it's great. And you look at the restless leg community. There's a lot of people who find that that really settles their restlessness down. So I think we have to be very careful that these are all just generalizations. Everybody who's listening to this may be different. So the menstrual phase, phase typically lasts about three to seven days. The phase begins on the first day of menstruation, with the, the day of bleeding, and it lasts until the bleeding stops. During this time, the lining of the uterus sheds um, and is lost through the vagina. Uh, during this time, hormonal activity, there's low estrogens of both estrogen and progesterone. And when it comes to sleep, many women experience fatigue and a need for more sleep during menstruation. And this has been a big focus of Maeve's. Like, I've really started paying attention and tracking my cycle. And during this time, really sort of taken it easy on myself, given myself a chance to, 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 to relax more, rest more, because this is a time of relatively lower energy for me. Some religions... They, they sort of make use of this. And it's a time where you take care of the woman when she is menstruating. So I love the idea of it being a positive, like let's, you know, during this, it's like somebody, when somebody has a migraine, you, you, you expect less of them. You expect less of yourself maybe. Um, so uh, during this time, there's low levels of hormones, but menstrual cramps and heavy bleeding can make sleep more challenging for some women. And women who suffer from premenstrual syndrome, PMS, or premenstrual dysphoric disorder, PMDD, experience poor sleep more frequently than those without either condition. And we mentioned that in an episode of the podcast previously, um, as it relates to work that, that had come out, I believe, of the, the Houston meeting. So from that, we go to the follicular phase, which generally lasts about 13 to 14 days. This is the phase that starts on the first day of menstruation and continues until ovulation. The pituitary gland is releasing its follicular, your follicle stimulating hormone, we call it FSH, which stimulates the development of multiple follicles in the ovaries, but only one matures into an egg. Uh, while the others die, the uterine lining thickens to prepare for the possibility of the implantation and the pregnancy. Hormone level during this time is estrogens generally increasing and progesterone remains relatively low. Uh, what's happening with sleep during this time? Estrogen has been associated with improvements in sleep quality. We've talked about that before because when you lose it, you tend to lose some of that sleep quality, potentially contribute to better sleep during this phase of the menstrual cycle. However, other research shows that for some women, as estrogen levels increase during the follicular phase, this can lead to increased energy and alertness that may make it harder to fall asleep. So when the sleep happens, it might be better but feeling better, feeling more energetic might make it difficult for some women to settle and get ready for sleep. So I, again, tracking your menstrual cycle, this might be the time where you do things a little bit more to prepare yourself for sleep. This is the time for the meditation. This is the time for the dimmer lights. Hey, thinking about our, our listener, this is the time for that self-hypnosis technique that you learned because you're going to have a slightly difficult, more difficult time winding down, but you've got a plan in place for it, right? It's always difficult to deal with something that's kind of thrown at you, but you know, I tried my cycle, it's X many days. And during these days, I sometimes find it a little bit difficult to turn off my brain. But once I fall asleep, I do tend to sleep better. And estrogen also plays a role in body temperature regulation, which should come as a surprise to nobody. And many women often experience a slight decrease in basal body temperature just before ovulation, which might expect, uh, affect sleep patterns. And we know that, I mean, anybody who's you know tracked ovulation in terms of with your partner trying to get pregnant, you know, there is a, a method that involves you know tracking your body temperature. And when the body temperature dips, that can be a sign um, that you're about to ovulate. So that leads us to, drum roll, the ovulation phase, which typically occurs around 14, day 14 of a 28-day cycle. 
It's when the mature egg is released from the ovary into the fallopian tube, travels down. There's a surge in luteinizing hormone, which triggers the ovulation. And this is the most fertile phase of the menstrual cycle. And as it relates to sleep, research shows that some women sleep better around ovulation. And the improvement in sleep around ovulation suggests a possible link between elevated estrogen levels and better sleep. So once again, estrogen high tends to relate to better sleep. And then there's the luteal phase, which lasts about 14 days. Um, after ovulation, the empty follicle becomes the corpus luteum, which secretes progesterone and some estrogen to maintain the uterine lining for the potential pregnancy. If fertilization does not, occur, does not occur, the corpus luteum degenerates, causing hormone levels to drop because it's creating hormone, leading to the breakdown and shedding of the urine lining, initiating the menstruation phase. Hormone activity, progesterone rises and then falls during this phase. Estrogen decreases further during this phase because, again, it would be building things up, so it's declining at this point. So declining estrogen, you can kind of guess what's going to happen here. The luteal phase is often associated with increased waking during the night and decreased slow wave sleep and an increase in core body temperature. Sleep quality appears to be lowest during the mid to late luteal phase, right when all hormones are rapidly declining before menstruation begins. And that falling level of estrogen and progesterone in the days before your period also linked to reduce sleep quality. So those are the four phases. What does it mean? What do we do about it? The interventions are important. And, you know, this is something that Maeve really practices. It's something that's really important uh, to a lot of the people that she works with. It's, it's listening to your body and tracking your cycle. And I'm a huge diary fan. We talk about sleep diaries all the time. As a neurologist, we do migraine diaries. I mean, when you sit down to talk to a doctor about something, Generally, generally, these things have been going on. Obviously, there's acute things. I suddenly woke up, had the worst headache of my life, couldn't see in my left eye. So, you know, there's not a lot of history there. But for a lot of things that doctors deal with, particularly sleep doctors, doctors dealing with chronic pain, doctors dealing with migraine, there's a history here. This has been going on for a long time. People can't figure out what's going on with my sleep. I'm really struggling. That tracking can be extremely important because tracking is where we recognize patterns. So listen to your body. Tracking is one way to kind of figure that out. So there's tremendous variability in, in people's cycles, but that cycle tracking is a way to understand what's typical for you. And becoming aware of what's typical for you makes it really easy to, to or at least easier, to notice patterns within your menstrual cycle and prepare accordingly. Example. So Maeve noted when, when you're in your, when you're, in your sleep cycle tends to be subpar planning for more restful activity. So if you know during this part of my menstrual cycle, my sleep generally doesn't tend to be that great, perhaps you factor in a little bit of extra sleep. Maybe this is the time when you plan on taking a nap. Maybe this is the time when you don't schedule something that you really need your best sleep for. I mean, uh, it, it becomes a very powerful tool, kind of understanding these things about yourself. And the NIH discusses it as a fifth vital sign, which when I hear fifth vital sign, I immediately go back to Purdue Pharma because they kept pushing the fifth vital sign was pain. But apparently in 2024, now the fifth, fifth vital sign is the menstrual cycle, uh, which is outstanding. And, um, you know, menstrual irregularities can often indicate hormone imbalances, imbalances, gynecological disease, and even infections. So it's important that sleep hygiene, temperature regulation, listening to your body when it wants to sleep, we, we pay attention to. So unfortunately, especially with the very limited research that's available, um, it's just not as simple as you're going to sleep great when this happens and you're going to sleep poorly when this happens. But there is valuable information about your sleep within your hormone cycle. And I'd love to hear with your menstrual cycle. And if you tune into it, I'd love to understand and hear what you found out about it. So let us know, how does your menstrual cycle affect your sleep? Um, what things have you done differently understanding that about yourself? Let the show know. DR Chris Winter Twitter, DR Chris Winter Instagram. Love to hear more about it. And again, if you are somebody who fits the criteria to be in this study, you are an individual who is 18, age 18 to 50, experience a menstrual cycle, and you're affiliated with a religion or spirituality sort of practice, 
please get in touch with me. Find my information on my social media. Get in touch with Maeve's study. She would really appreciate um, you sharing that with other people, other populations. She would love to get a huge sample of women in that study. So that's it. Thank you very much for listening to this episode of the podcast. My name is Chris Winner. You can find me at Dr. Chris Winner Instagram, Dr. Chris Winner Twitter, Dr. Chris Winner TikTok. Um, my books, The Sleep Solution: Why Your Sleep's Broken, How to Fix It, as well as The Rested Child, are available where sleep books are sold. Find Cheryl Crow and the rest of our musical artists on our Spotify playlist. And until next week, sleep well. <laughs>